Hey everyone, today I've got something a little weird for you. There's an Islamic YouTube channel that's seen huge growth recently called There Is No Clash, meaning no clash between science and Islam. It's presented by Claire Forestier, a freelancer who I'm pretty sure is not a Muslim and was just hired as the face of the channel. These videos are what you might expect from Islamic apologetics if you've seen my previous videos on the subject. They claim that the Quran contains scientific knowledge that could not have been known at the time it was written in an attempt to establish its supernatural origin. But the specific claims it makes about what science is in the Quran are a little bit out of the ordinary. In the video we're looking at today, Claire explains to us that the Quran says that humans evolved in Africa. Now if you're familiar with typical Muslim apologetics, you might know that even when evolution is accepted in general, it's extremely rare to see human evolution accepted. And while it's heartening to see fairly prominent apologists doing this, even despite the controversy it generates among their Muslim audience, the way they do it is deep deeply silly and dishonest, not to mention scientifically inaccurate. And it's only done to convince gullible people who happen to also accept evolution to follow their religion. And so of course I have serious problems with it. It's always a good idea to watch the videos I'm responding to to get the full context, but in this case I would highly recommend that you watch the original video first because it brings up multiple different ideas separately without actually getting to the point, and only after it's established all those different threads does it actually bring them together to build the final argument. So it's gonna get a little bit confusing, especially since the format forces me to address some claims before they're actually made in the video, because I have to address why they're bringing up certain things even though they haven't yet said why they're bringing it up. So we'll get to the video with Claire in a minute, but first I want to quickly look at a follow-up video they put out in which there's a different presenter who's visiting Ethiopia trying to further explain the reasons for their position. I won't bother showing the reasoning part because we'll see that in the main video, but I want to show this clip as an example of the poor level of scientific understanding that we're dealing with here. So this presenter is explaining what it means that the Quran uses a gender-neutral term to refer to Adam's mate, meaning that that mate was not necessarily a woman. Eve. So the term used by God in this case is a neutral term and simply means mate. It doesn't specify whether this person was male or female. So this is consistent with the evolutionary view that at the beginning there were no men or women. There was one single species or organism that eventually specified and developed female and male sex organs. So all that to say that we are the species from which men and women appeared. We had rudimentary organs that specified into male and female organs. I'll give y'all a second to pick your jaws up off the floor. I don't know if that was long enough, it wouldn't have been for me, but I'm gonna move on anyway. I bet you thought at first that she was talking about the evolution of sexual reproduction in non-human species, right? Until she made it clear that she means that humans had rudimentary sex organs that later specified into male and female. I hope the people over at No Clash realize that if they're going to appeal to a more modern scientific crowd with these videos, they can't go around saying things like that the evolutionary view is that humans started off with no sex organs. That is a remarkably ignorant statement. In my opinion, even worse than the classics, like if we come from monkeys, how come there are still monkeys? And it immediately calls into question whether these people care even a little bit about the science that they're trying to use to confirm the Quran. So what are we saying here? Are we saying that there was no creationism, God did not create man, it all happened on its own. Of course not, of course that is not what we're saying. What we are saying in fact is that God is the cause of all these things. God is the one that made this happen. So evolution means creation and evolution. God created organisms, God created life, and from this life evolved more life and from that life evolved humans. So they're pushing your typical theistic evolution. Natural selections out of the picture, replaced by deliberate selection by God to lead to human beings. And apparently, in this version of evolution, humans somehow evolved despite only having rudimentary non-specific sex organs. Look, if these folks really want to interpret the Quran so generously that it verges on a total rewrite, fine. I don't care about the Quran. If you want to twist that book until it breaks, nothing of value is lost. But when they start misinterpreting science this severely to fit scripture, I do have a problem with it. Anyway, let's get into the meat of the video. The theory has two main points. First, all life on Earth is connected and related to each other. Trace back the separate lines of descent of all organisms that ever lived and they will converge to a single point of origin, the beginning of life. Charles Darwin was reluctant to publish his views on the origins of life. His only speculations on the subject are known from a private letter to his friend and colleague Joseph Hooker, in which he speaks of a warm little pond in which the first molecules of life could have formed. 
The Holy Quran, written over 1400 years ago, tells us that all life on earth is connected and related to each other when it says, and we, God, made from water all living things. I'm getting flashbacks to my last video, which was also about science in the Quran, where I discussed a claim about this very thing and point out the sheer obviousness of the idea of all life coming from water to anyone who'd ever seen rain cause life to grow out of the ground. What I didn't point out in that video, but kind of wish I had because it's an interesting extra piece of the puzzle, is that in Surah 71, which Claire is also going to cite soon, verse 17 says that Allah made humans grow out of the earth, and some translations even go so far as to specify, like a plant. That makes it hard to sustain a claim of Muhammad's miraculous knowledge of the chemical composition of a human when you realize that made from water really just means it rained on the earth and humans grew out of it. Second, this diversity of life is a product of modifications of populations by natural selection where some traits were favored in an environment over others. And the Holy Quran tells us that the history of creation is a history of both creation and selection when it says, your Lord creates whatever he wills and selects. I am incredibly curious what translation you're using. None of the translations on Quran.com translated as selects. They all use chooses. Your Lord creates what he wills and chooses, that sort of thing. That is, he creates whatever he chooses to create. And here's where it starts to become clear what your goal is. Use the most scientific sounding translation of a verse you can find, even if it's it's incredibly obscure or you have to translate it yourself and then read into it as hard as you possibly can to force it to say way more than it actually says even in your translation. The Holy Quran also tells us that the prophet Adam was brought to prophecy by selection when it says indeed Allah God selected Adam and Noah and the family of Abraham and the family of Imran above all people. Well yeah those are the stories, right? I mean, you or whoever wrote the script you're awkwardly reading off that teleprompter believe Adam was chosen from among a group of people who already existed. When Allah addresses Adam, he doesn't say, you Adam, come down. He says, and come down all of you. All of you, suggesting that again, Adam was with a group of people. He was not alone on this planet. And Noah and the families of Abraham and Imran or Joachim, the father of Mary, were all chosen by God for their respective tasks. And you were selected as the presenter of There Is No Clash. How exactly does this selection of a person by God for some task imply evolution in any way? At the heart of Darwin's theory of evolution is the notion of copying and the variations it creates, meaning that it is copying results in several evolutionary successive stages. Similarly, the Holy Quran tells us that God created us in successive stages when it says, what is the matter with you that you do not hope for honor from Allah when he created you in successive stages? Another obscure or even new translation, but that's fine. So you think those successive stages mean evolutionary stages, but I find it odd that you've ignored the part of the Quran where it actually lists out the stages of human development. Here's chapter 23 verses 12 to 14. And indeed we created man out of an extract of clay. Thereafter we made him as a nutfa, usually translated as a sperm drop, in a safe lodging. Then we made the nutfa into a clot, and then we made the clot into a little lump of flesh, and then we made out of that little lump of flesh bones. Then we clothed the bones with flesh, and then we brought it forth as another creation. So the Quran already proposes a set of stages in which Allah creates humans. Do you seriously find it more likely that it's actually referring to stages of evolution in spite of that? Charles Darwin believed that humans evolved in Africa and that the root of the human tree was very deeply ingrained there. And in 1962, our roots were shown to be definitively in Africa. And the Holy Quran confirms this when it says in a very short chapter of only eight verses, by the fig and the olive, by the mountain of Senyin. The word in Arabic is Sinin, and it refers to Mount Sinai, but it has to be translated this way as Senyin to fit the narrative. We're not dealing with this now, it'll come up later, go on. And by the secure city Mecca, we've indeed created the human in the best directed shape. Hey, guess which translation that shows up in? Well, once again, it's in your special, very convenient translation, and apparently no other. The word taqweem very broadly means form, and it's usually translated as mold, form, or stature. 
But we'll see soon how you want to link the form of humans mentioned here with the evolution of an upright standing posture. And that's going to be dead on arrival because you've just made up a translation that isn't actually implied by the word itself. Just so you can make the Quran speak for you instead of for itself. Then we returned him to the lowest of the low, except those who believed and did righteous deeds. For them there is a reward unending. So what it causes you to deny the recompense, i.e. day of resurrection, is not Allah the most just of judges. None of that surah you just read says anything at all about human evolution. Not a hint of a whiff of a suggestion, but I'll let you explain it before I get too far into that. Let's take a look at exactly how this short chapter about figs, olives, and the mountain of Senyin Sinai explains the origins of humankind. If Surah 95 was seriously written by God as an explanation of human origins, then regardless of how you spin it in the next couple of minutes, it is a terrible explanation and he should be ashamed of himself. In an article for BBC Earth published on the 17th of January 2017, Mike Shanahan writes that fig trees have not only witnessed history but have shaped it. Wild fig trees first grew in Africa around 80 million years ago. I think the source for this is the same BBC article that you're reading from. I'm just going to assume Mike Shanahan got it right. I'll link the article in the description so people can find it easily. Humans have been eating figs throughout history. Well, yeah, they're common and they're native to a lot of warm places, so they were a common food for a lot of cultures for a very long time, and still are. Figs not only nourish animals, but the year-round presence of ripe figs would have helped sustain our early human ancestors. High-energy figs may have helped our ancestors to develop bigger brains. There's also a theory that suggests our hands evolved as tools for assessing which figs are soft and therefore sweet and rich in energy. While the first humans benefited from fig biology, their descendants mastered it. And where exactly does the wild fig tree called Ficus vasta grow? In or near the Horn of Africa, and it's primarily endemic to Ethiopia. And Yemen, your slide says. Ethiopia and Yemen. So you go off talking about olives and mountains right after this, and so it takes you a while to circle back around to the point. So I'm going to address the point that you'll eventually get to right now. The point is basically that figs are from Ethiopia, and the Quran links figs to primates because figs and primates originated around sorta kinda the same time, and then all you have to do is take a running jump over a logical gap and voila! The Quran is talking about humans originating in Ethiopia. That's kinda oversimplified, we'll get to the detailed version later of course, but it's basically the kind of thinking that's employed. For now we'll just talk about figs. So you've very clearly chosen a species of fig that's convenient for your narrative. If you really wanted to talk about where figs are from, you either would have talked about the genus Ficus generally, which is endemic to a vast area because figs grow natively in tropical areas worldwide, or you could have talked about Ficus carica, the common fig more specifically. That's the most commonly eaten fig, although it's far from the only edible one. But of course the problem is, the common fig grows natively all over Western Asia, so that wouldn't fit your requirement that the fig you select has to be from Ethiopia. And so instead you chose Ficus vasta, a choice so weirdly specific it could only be done with the intention to mislead. And even though you were so careful about your choice, you still only managed to find a fig that grows in Ethiopia and Yemen, which is, for people who don't know, on the Arabian Peninsula. And seeing as you copy-pasted that quote right out of Wikipedia, I'm just going to read the second half of the sentence you copied that you didn't put in your video. But can also be found in the Sudan, Somalia, and Saudi Arabia, and into Uganda and Tanzania in the African Great Lakes region. Wow. So even cherry-picking the most convenient species of fig you could find, you still had to delete the majority of what your own source says to make it say anything even close to what you wanted. That is some next-level bullshittery, guys. And now for olives, whose tree has been called the tree of life. In an article on the Australian Broadcasting Corporation's website on the 7th of February 2013, Dr. Guillaume Besnard of the French National Centre for Scientific Research explains that his research has concluded that three main branches of wild olives split from a common ancestral tree at least 1.5 million years ago. Yes, at least 1.5 million years ago. I read the relevant part of the paper and what it says is they estimated the time of the most recent common ancestor for three main Mediterranean olive lineages and they found, and here's the important bit, that that divergence is between 1.66 and 6.17 million years ago. That's a bit broader than just saying one and a half million years. We'll talk more about what a most recent common ancestor means a little bit later. Now on to mountains. In an article in the New York Times by Carl Zimmer on May 30th, 2013, 
Zimmer states that in the hearts of evolutionary biologists, mountains occupy a special place. It's not just their physical majesty, mountains also have an unmatched power to drive human evolution. Our ancestors moved to high altitudes and there they experienced natural selection that has reworked their biology, like the adjustment of hemoglobin levels, for example. You know, I really wish you'd tie all this seemingly random stuff about figs and olives and mountains together sooner so it's not so damn confusing for my audience. But you don't, so I gotta jump ahead a bit and explain the point of this in advance. The stuff about mountains sort of encouraging human evolution is gonna lead to the claim that Adam and Eve lived on Mount Senyon, and that therefore Mount Senyon has something to do with human evolution. And so apparently the purpose of bringing up this hemoglobin thing is to show that mountains are somehow hot spots of human evolution, even though all this article actually says is that humans have adapted over time to life at higher altitudes. That does not imply that mountains are somehow especially responsible for causing the evolution of humans from previous species, which I can only assume is what these people want you to assume from this article. This is the most extreme example in humans that you can find, said Rasmus Nielsen, an evolutionary biologist at the University of California at Berkeley. Humans have adapted to mountainous environments, just as Charles Darwin predicted. Yes, but there's no indication that adaptation to mountains is the primary thing that made us human in the first place. To put it in terms you might use, it's not what was responsible for the origin of Adam and his mate. A BBC News article in March 2015 revealed that a research team led by Professor Brian Vilmore from the University of Nevada in Las Vegas had discovered what they called the most important transition in human evolution. This is the transition from tree dweller to upright walker. This transition happened and was discovered in Ethiopia. That's not even close to what that BBC article says. Did you even read your own source? It's obviously not about the discovery of some transitional form between tree dwellers and upright walkers because, as it says, they viewed this fossil jawbone as a link between Lucy, the upright walking Australopithecus afarensis, and Homo erectus. That's transitional between upright and upright, not tree dweller and upright. Although I should point out that tree dweller and upright walker are not necessarily mutually exclusive, and Australopithecus and Ororin and even Artipithecus might have fit in both categories. Anyway, this fossil jaw that they they found was useful because not many human fossils have been found for that time period. It was dated to 2.8 million years, whereas the previous oldest Homo fossil was from 2.35 million years ago. Now I want to make it clear, this is all from your source, no clash writers, and it says nothing even resembling what you say it says. It does go on to talk about climate change, but only in the sense that a different study of fossilized plant and animal life showed that the area had turned from forest to dry grassland around a similar time, which could be a possible reason why upright, non-tree-dwelling humans could have been developing more around that time. Which, by the way, completely torches any implication you wanted to make that mountains are what drove the evolution of pre-humans into humans. And then, as if to really rub it in your faces just how bad you are at reading what you cite, it goes on to say, He notes that the emergence of human-like characteristics was not unique to Ethiopia. The human-like features shown by Australopithecus sediba in South Africa at around 1.95 million years ago are likely to have developed independently of the processes which produced humans in East Africa, showing that parallel origins are a distinct possibility. Now, regardless of what the real answer is to where humans really first arose specifically, or what species preceded us, or any of that, the presence of something like that in the source that you chose to cite as an authority to back up your claims, when that source contradicts so badly what you're trying to insist is definitely true about human origins in Ethiopia is just hilarious. Human evolution, also known as hominization, is the evolutionary process that led to the emergence of anatomically modern humans, beginning with the evolutionary history of primates, which appeared at least 80 million years ago. I don't think it's anywhere near that long, I think it's more like 60 million. But I don't have a source for that close at hand and I'm kind of getting tired, so you know what? Fine, we'll round up to your number and call it more or less good. And leading to the emergence of Homo erectus, or upright man, which was the first creature to stand fully upright. But that's just not true. Australopithecus shows every sign of having walked upright, and they were around nearly 4 million years ago, whereas there's no fossil evidence of Homo erectus before like 2 million years ago. And Homo habilis was around before Homo erectus too, so oh, never mind. That appeared at least 1.5 million years ago. Homo erectus? Yeah. So what do all these findings in all these articles have to do with that short chapter of 
the Quran we mentioned. Dick all, Claire, but I'm glad we're finally getting to the goddamn point. Simply put, the Holy Quran points to Africa and tells us that the history of the upright man's evolution started with the evolution of primates at least 80 million years ago and led to an upright man at least one and a half million years ago. It tells you nothing of the sort and you know it. How exactly does the Holy Quran do this? It doesn't. By swearing by the fig, which first grew in Africa around 80 million years ago, and by the olive, which split from its common ancestral tree about 1.5 million years ago. All right, finally you're starting to tie together all these seemingly random things you've been saying, and I can start tying together all this random information I've been replying with. So we have the fig, claimed to be about 80 million years old, which I'll accept. And then we have an article estimating the divergence of three main lineages of olives from a common ancestor. And I'm curious if anyone working at No Clash actually knows what most recent common ancestor means. The name should be self-explanatory, but I'll tell you a secret, Claire. It's utterly irrelevant. Knowing when dominant lineages of olives diverged from each other doesn't tell you shit about when olives first appeared. Why? Because the most recent common ancestor of all of those olives was already an olive. For all you know from that information, olives could have been around a hundred million years before that. With figs, you used a number that at least sort of means something, when figs first appeared on the planet. But with the olives, if you did that, you wouldn't have had a satisfactory number, so you had to come up with something else. So what I'm guessing you did is you looked around to see all the different numbers of millions of years that are associated with olives in any way, and you noticed that this 1.5 million years number is somewhere in the general ballpark of how long Homo erectus has been around, and you went, okay, that works, let's use that, without really caring what that 1.5 million years actually refers to or what the relevance of it is to anything. By the way, why was it important that the figs, which are supposed to represent the not necessarily Ethiopian-originated earliest primates, were from Ethiopia? But then it doesn't matter that the olives, which are supposed to represent the supposedly Ethiopian-originated Homo erectus, aren't from Ethiopia. Well, I guess because you couldn't find a way to make it sound like the Mediterranean lineages of olives that your article talks about originated in the distinctly non-Mediterranean Ethiopia. And so you just chose to say fuck it and ignore that giant inconsistency. It's very convenient how you pick and choose which details matter when. And by the mountain of Senyin, which is found in Ethiopia and now called Choke Mountain. Oh, I can't wait to get deep into this mountain thing, but I'll wait until you do. And finally, by swearing to Mecca, the land of Islam that God created the human in the best erected shape. The word taqween, used in the original Arabic of the verse, means erected, which means to raise and set in an upright or vertical position. No, it seriously doesn't, which is why it's not translated that way by Muslims or non-Muslims. It just means form, very generally. As I said before, it's a pretty broad word, and probably deliberately so, to refer to the overall quality of God's creation of humans, and not anything specific about their shape. But whether it's deliberately vague or not, it certainly does not refer specifically to an upright posture. And God says after that, we then returned the human back to the lowest of the low. Yep, yeah, meaning he sent them to hell. You can tell because of how the next verse goes on. Save those who believe and do righteous deeds, then they shall have a reward without end. So those who believe go to paradise, and those who don't believe are reduced to the lowest of the low by being tortured in hell. And now scientists are searching for our ancestors in the Afar Desert of Ethiopia, which coincidentally happens to be the lowest point in Ethiopia, the lowest in Africa, and the lowest point on the planet. Let me get this straight. You think that the verse that's directly paired with paradise is the fate of the unbelievers does not refer to hell, but refers to being sent back home to Ethiopia? Ya yeah, ilahi, that's a fate worse than hell. Just kidding, Ethiopian viewers, I'm sure it's very nice there. But you guys know that, like, everything is wrong with that statement, right? Okay, I'm sure someone is searching for human ancestors in the Afar Desert. I mean, people are searching for fossil hominins all over the place. All over Africa, in Europe, in Asia. So what is this even supposed to mean? And by the way, the Afar Desert is not the lowest point on the planet. That's Challenger Deep, 11 kilometers below sea level. But you probably mean the lowest point on dry land, and the Afar Desert doesn't even come close to that either. That honor goes to the area around the Dead Sea. Afar is not even the lowest place in Africa. Even the quotes from the BBC article that you put on your own slide realize this. So again, your own source is totally contradicting you, and you're so dumb that you put it on the screen while you were in the process of lying about what it says. Come on! This is how a brief chapter of eight verses summarizes millions of years of human evolution 
in a book revealed 1400 years ago by God himself. This is how it doesn't do that at all. But how could the Prophet Muhammad have known about the link between the creation of humans in an erected shape and the millions of years of evolution that took place between the appearance of the fig and the olive? Um, he didn't? He didn't say erected shape, he didn't refer to the amount of time figs have been around, he didn't refer to the amount of time olives have been around, or sorry, the amount of time since three arbitrary lineages split off from a common ancestor olive that was already around for millions of years before that. He didn't provide any instruction to compare some very badly fudged numbers for the time of the origin of figs and primates, or the current main olive lineages and homo erectus. And by the way, I don't even know how you thought, hey look, these numbers we found are sorta kinda similar, plus or minus a few million years, was a good argument. Like, forget whether anything you're saying is true, which it's not. No part of your argument even makes any damn sense. Oh, and another couple interesting things here. The way you say the millions of years of evolution that took place between the appearance of the fig and the olive seems to imply that you think that the divergence of the current lineages of olives from a common ancestor olive is the same thing as the origin of the olive. And the millions of years of evolution that took place between the appearance of the fig and the olive. And the way that you compare that, the millions of years between the fig and the olive, to the evolution of the earliest primates into the earliest humans, almost seems to imply that you think figs evolved into olives, at least if this analogy is to hold together in any way whatsoever. And while I really don't want to assume that about you, I also wouldn't put it past you at this point. You guys are idiots. And how could he have known about the link between the creation of humans in an erected shape and an African Amharic mountain in Ethiopia? Guess my answer. Or even about the location of the mountain of Senyin that has for years been wrongly translated as the mountain of Sinai in Egypt. That's right. Every reading of the Quran in Arabic, English, or any other language for the past millennium and a half that's interpreted this to mean Mount Sinai, and every Quranic scholar since the time of Muhammad has failed to understand this reference, which clearly and obviously must refer to some obscure mountain in Ethiopia because no clash wants people who accept evolution to convert to Islam. That's a good reason. And that we just recently discovered thanks to satellite mapping. Apparently we just discovered this mountain by using satellite mapping, despite the fact that the mountain is fucking covered in towns that people live in. Look, you can even see their farms in the background of your own video. Just how obscure do you think this mountain is that we had to use satellites to find it? In short, he could not have known. In short, he didn't know, not just because he was ignorant, but also because you're talking bullshit on every level. So where is this mysterious mountain that turns out to be of great significance? By all indications, in your imagination. The mountain of Senyin is in an Amharic town, which is not even known by most Ethiopians. The mountain is in a town? No. There are a bunch of towns on and around the mountain, but the mountain is not in a town. I'll show you in a second. It's now called Choke Mountain and can be found in the Ethiopian highlands, located in the Amhara National Regional State, East Gojam Zone, northwest of the town of Debra Marcos. All right, finally we're here. Time to talk about the mountain. So, your assertion is that this mountain was formerly called Senyin. You didn't provide any sources for this, and as far as I can tell, they don't exist. There's no sign anywhere of anyone ever calling this mountain anything other than Choka, or Choka with a Q, or Choka Tarara, or possibly Birhan. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce it, although I'm pretty sure it's not just Choke. And when it's not northwest of Debra Marcos, it's northeast of it. No wonder your guide got so confused that he actually had to hire a guide of his own. You probably said he should lead you northwest of Debra Marcos to Mount Senyin. Poor guy. The guide we had in Ethiopia had never been here before, so he had to hire a guide for himself. So we had two guides leading us to this mountain. But you do present a couple of images to show that this mountain is called Senyin. So let's look at those. First up, we have this map. Now that map is from this paper from World Development about drainage gully formation. And look at the difference between yours and the original. In the original, Senyin is shown quite clearly to be a town on the mountain, no different from any other town in the area. But you've blown that name up to associate it more strongly with the mountain. I'll overlay this map on Google Maps satellite imagery so you can see what Senyin really is referring to. This tiny little town is Senyin, not the mountain. And this other paper, just like the other one, lists Senyin as a town and marks it as a town on the map. Next up, you have this fake Google Maps image where you point to the village of Senyin. Again, not a reference to the mountain. And finally, you have a satellite image with a pointer on Senyin Village with a label Senyin, Choka Mountain, which is correct, the town of Senyin on Mount Choka. And again, no evidence that the mountain itself was ever named Senyin. And that's it.
So, because your own evidence was so lacking, I went off looking, and the first thing I found was a Wikipedia article that refers to the mountain not as Mount Senyan, but as Mount Seinin, with the Y moved. Well, I thought that could be something, except that when I looked at the changelog for that page, I found that Seinin was only added on May 12th, just a few days after your channel's last video on that topic. It seems someone out there really wanted to strengthen your claim by editing Wikipedia to agree with you, but they forgot to spell check. If you Google for Mount Senyan without quotes, what comes up mostly are your videos. And finally, if you Google for Mount Senyan in quotation marks, weirdly, the only results are your videos. And yet if you search for Mount Choka, you find plenty of results. It's almost as if the mountain is actually called Mount Choka, and always was called Mount Choka, at least as long as anyone's bothered to write about it, and Senyan is actually just one of the villages on the mountain. But after all the accurate information you've presented already, how could I possibly think you made something up? In chapter 2, verse 38 of the Holy Quran, God tells us that there is an order for all of mankind to descend when he states, we, God, said, descend from it, all of you. And when guidance comes to you from me, God, whoever follows my guidance, there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. Yeah, all mankind in the sense of Adam and Eve, yes, and Satan. All doesn't have to be addressed to more than two people, but in this case it is. It refers to those three. The word it here refers to the paradise where Adam and Eve lived before they sinned, when God said to all mankind in the Holy Quran, descend from it. That may mean that the paradise where Adam and Eve lived before they sinned was on earth and located at a height above sea level. It's odd that you mention Adam and Eve when the other lady was insistent that the Quran never mentions Eve and never makes it clear if Adam's mate was a woman, because humans didn't have distinct genitals yet. Anyway, what is it lately with people's hyper-literal interpretation of down? The guy in my last Quran science video had the same problem. But alright, let's interpret this literally. Get down from it, okay. Heaven is up, above the ceiling of the world, which is the sky, and the earth is down. And yes, it is talking about the earth, because just two verses earlier, in 236, it's made much more clear. We said, get you down all with enmity between yourselves. On earth will be a dwelling place for you, and an enjoyment for a time. The Arabic word for earth here is the same one that's used in, for example, chapter 20, verse 4, a revelation from him who has created the earth and high heavens, or 1940. Verily, we will inherit the earth and whatsoever is thereon, and to us they shall all be returned. Or 2384, say, whose is the earth and whosoever is therein, and plenty of other verses. By the way, don't you find it a little weird that if God told Adam and Eve, or sorry, Adam and gender non-specific companion, or sorry, Adam and every human being on the planet of which there were apparently a bunch, to get down from the incredible paradise of Mount Choka to live on earth instead, that someone would be able to just decide to climb right back up to paradise and stand there making a YouTube video? I would find that surprising. This nicely fits the characteristics of the mountain of Senyin, now called Choke Mountain in Ethiopia, Africa, and also happens to be the place where humans first evolved. Above sea level nicely fits the characteristics of Choka Mountain? Of course it does, because that nicely fits the characteristics of pretty much any mountain. But I thought you said scientists were searching for humanity's ancestors in the Afar Desert, supposedly the lowest place on Earth. That was an important point in your argument, but it makes no sense anymore if humans evolved on top of a mountain. In short, the Holy Quran simply confers the African roots of the human family tree. Only if you screw with the truth enough to make it look that way. You know, as I've been working on this and uncovering all the fudge details, the misread articles, the pointless quotes, quote mines, the lies by omission, and all the other failures of your video, I've realized that this is actually very similar to the Young Earth apologetics of people like Ken Hoven, but somehow even worse. Sure, you're arguing for human evolution, and that's nice, I guess, but just like Ken's material, this is all just a cynical attempt to trick people into believing that your religion is true. And sure, Kent will bend the truth and outright lie as much as you will to support his position, but at least he doesn't put stuff in his slides that directly contradicts him as often as you morons do. If you insist on doing this slimy bullshit, at least get good at it. So long before Darwin even used evolution as a mechanism to explain diversity and the development of species, the Holy Quran itself addressed the emergence, diversification, 
and origins of life on Earth. That was the most pathetic, transparent attempt to steal some of science's legitimacy and give it to a religion that I've ever seen in my life. You should all be ashamed of yourselves. I hope they pay you well for this job, Claire, because the fact that you took it makes you look like a real asshole. Especially when the very first video you did for these people had you calmly delivering threats of torture with seemingly not a care in the world. The author of this book gives us the total freedom to either believe or disbelieve in what he wrote, but at the same time the author tells us that he also has the freedom to determine our fate after death with either eternal happiness in paradise or an eternal painful punishment in hell. There is no third option. And no, I'm not going to get into it, but I really wanted to point out the depths of depravity that Claire will descend to for money. Threatening people for not believing in a religion that she doesn't even believe in herself. But to the people at No Clash, if you're worried that Allah will send you to hell if you disbelieve in what he wrote, I really hope you're ready to feel the heat because you've made it clear through this whole video that you don't actually believe what the Quran actually says. Well, that was a lot longer than usual, but my Patreon's been doing pretty good recently and I figured, what the hell, I'll do a bigger project. If you'd like to see more of this type of video, consider supporting me on Patreon like everyone on the screen. My $10 plus patrons get access to my Patreon exclusive videos, which is a collection of currently 13 videos that might interest you. Anyway, thanks for sticking with me all the way to the end on this one, everyone. I know it was a little tough. I'll see you next time.